Welcome to New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park's virtual performance series. The mission of the park is to serve the nation as a global leader in the dissemination of New Orleans jazz by enhancing and instilling a public appreciation and understanding of the origins, early history, development, and progression of this uniquely American music art form, jazz. The performance features Richard Scott seated on the piano on the left side of the stage and Jamil Sharif on trumpet seated on the center of the stage. Behind the performance is the Jazz Park mural depicting various musical icons and a contemporary brass band. The stage also contains a drum set on the far right and other musical equipment behind the performers. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the following performance. My name is Richard Piano Scott, and I've been doing interpretive programs for the New Orleans Jazz National Historic Park uh, since about 2004. I love talking about playing the piano and talking about the history of New Orleans jazz and uh, sharing what I know with people from all over the world. Today I'm especially happy because I get to share the stage with the great New Orleans legend and great trumpet player, Mr. Jamil Sharif. The song we just played for you is an old New Orleans style brass band number called Over in the Glory Land. Like many New Orleans jazz standards, it has its roots in gospel music. But it, now it's known as a brass band song, one you'll hear played in the streets of New Orleans or anywhere around town. And uh, we're going to be talking a bit today about 
New Orleans brass bands. You know, there's so many amazing styles of music that come out of New Orleans. People come to New Orleans, of course, from all over, and they come looking for music, and they come to learn that there's lots and lots of different styles of music that's associated with New Orleans, and that's one of the reasons I'm in love with our city, and I'm just fascinated by the culture. Brass bands are one of those styles of music that has long been associated with New Orleans. But we can follow this tradition back to their 1800s, long before there was such thing as jazz. Uh, then, back then, the New Orleans was one of the cities that had a great musical situation going on. New Orleanians always loved great music. And while there were brass bands and military-style bands playing in every major city across the country, in New Orleans, people really got involved with this tradition. We're going to go back to the 1870s. That was when a band was around called the Excelsior Band. And they were one of those military-style street bands, usually having a number of horns playing. By, when I say horn, I mean like a trumpet or a trombone or a saxophone or a clarinet. Usually had different combinations of those instruments. And then they had rhythm instruments like the bass drum and the snare drum and uh, that kind of thing. And then, of course, they had the sousaphone. We have a sousaphone hanging up on the wall here. And uh, we don't have anybody to play it for you today, but we're going to be talking about some of these great songs. We're going to start out with the most difficult song that we're going to play. That way, the rest of the program is easy. Absolutely. <laughs> but this is not a jazz song. This is a march. Marches were extremely popular in the late 1800s. Today, we think of marches and we just associate them maybe with a uh, you know, the 4th of July parade, but back in those days, marches were used for almost all types of social engagements. Uh, they had marches that were, of course, for, um, for dancing. They had marches for funerals. They have marches for weddings, and of course, the patriotic marches. I guess this is what you would consider a patriotic march, because this was written by the March King in America. His name was John Philip Sousa, and he wrote this song in the 1880s for the Marines, and the song is called Semper Fidelis, and uh, while it was written for them, we're going to share it with you now because it's a great song. Let's see if we can get this on the first try. <laughs> That's an old John Philip Sousa march called Semper Fidelis. And one of the reasons I wanted to do that one is because that was one of those numbers that were very popular in the late 1800s. In fact, um, there's a recording where Louis Armstrong is listening to that song and reminiscing about playing that song in the streets of New Orleans when he was a kid with the band that he was playing with. 
And so we know that that was an extremely popular song back in those days. Moving forward a little bit in time, I'd like to spend just a moment talking about another great band. Uh, this was uh, led by a musician who is not from New Orleans. He was actually from Mobile, Alabama. And his name was, was James Reese Europe. And he was an African-American man and a leader of this band that specialized in playing in an African-American style. That was something that he truly believed in, African-American music being totally separate from the styles of music that were popular at the time. Uh, they, he was under a lot of pressure as a band leader to play different styles of music, but that was what he truly believed and that's where his heart was. And that worked out very well for him because his band became famous, not just in the United States, but around the world for the style of music that they played. And uh, we're gonna, he started playing ragtime style music with his band and adding some different kinds of rhythms that people weren't used to hearing. And uh, we're going to do a song that this band played. The song was a hit for the great songwriter W.C. Handy, who's known as the father of the blues, who's also from Alabama. But anyway, the song is called The Memphis Blues. And we're going to do a little bit of this one for you. And uh, in, in, in a similar style, of course, we don't have the whole military band, but we love this song, and we're going to share it with you anyway. This is called The Memphis Blues. And this was a hit for James Reese Europe and his band called the Hell Fighters. They fought in World War I, and he recorded this song shortly after coming back from being over in France. Here we go. Thank you so much. 
And again, thanks you for, thank you for watching. We hope you're enjoying the program. You know, sometimes I forget to, to talk any about what I'm doing and, uh, you know, what we're doing on the stage. And so, although we're doing a program today about New Orleans brass bands, I'm playing the piano, obviously. I've been in New Orleans now for over 20 years. And uh, it's hard to believe it's been that long. I've been playing with Jamil Sharif for almost that long, back when he was playing uh, on Bourbon Street. And uh, he's still one of my most favorite musicians to get to work with. And, uh, you know, I'm playing a style of music that's very popular in New Orleans. It's called stride piano. And stride is sort of a situation where the piano player uses his or her left hand to play both the bass notes, like that. These are called the bass notes because they're the lowest notes. And then I also, with my left hand, am playing the accompaniment chords. It goes like this. oftentimes ask, well, what's the difference between playing stride and ragtime? And I point out that ragtime is very similar to stride music, but when you're playing stride-style piano, you're making up the music yourself, whereas when you're playing ragtime music, you're reading the notes that are printed on a page. And so I'm playing whatever I want with my right hand, whether it's playing the melody or playing an improvised solo line, while with my left hand, I'm playing that stride-style piano. So that's, that's a style of music that it wasn't born in New Orleans, but so many great stride piano players came from New Orleans. Some of my favorites include uh, Jelly Roll Morton, is one of my most favorite piano players, and one of the great jazz pioneers from New Orleans. In fact, Jelly Roll Morton is really an interesting character to talk about for a number of reasons. One is, he was one of the first people to really describe what it was like hearing a brass band in New Orleans back in the early, uh, early 1900s. And he described in great detail what it was like. And it was really interesting, both good and bad. Of course, the musicians were great. One of my favorite things he talked about is that when the drums were going down the street, they would, they would throw their sticks so they would bounce on the ground and then they'd catch them. And he said that, you know, they, they could not ever drop the stick. Because if they dropped the stick, their friends would laugh at them and they would be humiliated, you know. So, yeah, I have, a, I have an idea that these drummers would practice that for a long time before they dared to, to do this trick on the streets of New Orleans, you know. Because, you know, when you're chasing a stick around, that's embarrassing, you know. But he talked also about, when I talked about the bad things, he talked about how a lot of times these bands that would parade around the streets, they would get into to nasty brawls when they would cross over into another uh, section of town. Down in New Orleans, we call these the wards, you know? And if you're playing, in, if your band is in the eighth ward, you cross the Elysian Fields into that seventh ward, well, you know, a lot of things can happen, and not all of them are good, you know? It's sort of like going into somebody else's territory, you Absolutely. know? And, and he would talk about how some ugly fights would break out. But, you know, but th that just shows how the, the, the neighborhoods in New Orleans had a lot of pride. And they, they took a lot of pride in their bands that were playing and in their music, you know. And so uh, Jelly Roll Morton was really, uh, you know, he really helps us illuminate what it was like, you know, back in those days. Uh, and back in those days, a lot of the bands that would play in the streets, they were part of what we call social aid and pleasure clubs. Now, in the days before they offered life insurance to people in all cultures, African Americans did not necessarily have access to this benefit. And so instead of life insurance, uh, they would get together as a community and form these benevolent societies. And the way they would work is everybody would put a little bit of money in every month and so that when you needed it, they would come and help you out, you know. And uh, the, the way I heard it was, uh, you know, when you pass away, your widow would have the choice of either, uh, you know, having some money or hiring a band and having a big funeral. And most people know in New Orleans they would much rather have a party. Have a party. Yeah, have a party. And so uh, Jelly Roll Morton in his writing, he talks about these parties. And he didn't really play a brass instrument, but what Jelly Roll Morton, this is... I guess before he was called Jelly Roll when he was just a kid, he and his friends would go around town, they'd find out where there was going to be a funeral, and they would show up, and they would go in and they would sing. 
They would sing a, you know, in harmony. They'd sing a beautiful, a beautiful song, you know, in in uh, in respect to the whoever had passed away. They I'm sure they had no idea who had passed away, but they would come in and and sing a beautiful song. And every time they did that, they would be invited to the kitchen, where there'd be all sorts of sandwiches and food laying out. And so that's that was their payment back in those days. But we're gonna do one of the songs that Jelly Roll Morton used to do, and uh, I, this is also a song that brass bands did. Uh, they served, uh, like I said, these marches served lots of different purposes. And uh, we started out by playing a, playing a military march, and then we played a blues song. Well, here's another style that they used to do, and that was a funeral dirge. And so we're going to do a, bit, a little bit of this one, and it's called uh, Flee as a Bird to the Mountain, I believe is what it's called. Right. And uh, we're going to do a little bit of this one for you. And these songs are very, very slow and mournful. And uh, I have a, I've played in some brass bands before, and when you're not used to playing that slow, it's a little bit hard to play that slow. Very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and I, like, the, like all the great marches, these songs would start out with what we call a roll-off, and that's when the drums play a certain rhythm that lets the band know that the song is about to start. And, like, you know, the popular roll-off for up-tempo songs is like, rump bump rump bump rump bump right? That's when you know they're going to start the song. But with the funeral dirge, it's more like... Boom. Boom. <laughs> like just waking up out of a sleep when you land. Right, right. That's what it feels like. And anyway, we're gonna we're gonna play this song and I'm gonna try to play slow, which is not my forte, but we're gonna give it a try. All right, here we go. That's a funeral dirge right there, and that's one of the old funeral dirges that was long associated with the New Orleans brass band tradition. A lot of these songs came straight out of the Baptist hymnal, and uh, the first song that we played for you today, Over in the Glory Land, is one of those songs that came out of that, uh, that, of that book, you know? And uh, yeah, 
you know, this next song uh, we're going to do is another one that Jelly Roll Morton did. In fact, he did uh, a little recording where he put these two songs together. And what he was doing in this recording is trying to capture the feeling of a New Orleans jazz funeral. If you've ever been to New Orleans and gotten to see a jazz funeral, you'll know that the way they do it is very strict. They start out playing a very slow and respectful funeral dirge like the one that we just played. And then after the body is laid to rest in the cemetery or a mausoleum or wherever, then the style of the event changes into more of a celebration. And that's when you'll see people dancing. That's when you'll see people parading through the neighborhood. They're celebrating the life of the person that they're leaving behind and that they're sending that person off to a better place. Now, it's believed that that is a tradition that goes back to Africa and then came into New Orleans uh, via Haiti with the musicians and, and the culture that came into New Orleans from there. Regardless, it's a New Orleans tradition that you'll find everywhere today, but you gotta remember, you play as slow and respectful until you cut them loose. Now, after the body's laid to rest, then it's okay to, uh, to party a little bit. And I've seen some crazy, crazy stuff, you know. All the good. Right, <laughs> you'll see everything down here, but that's, that's the general rule. And uh, in Jelly Roll Morton's recording, uh, he did this in Chicago in the 1920s after he left New Orleans. And uh, he and his band called the Red Hot Peppers, they had a lot of fun with these recordings. And he played Flea as a Bird. And when he played that song, everybody in the band started moaning and howling just like they were at a, you know, at a funeral. And then uh, Jelly Roll Morton pretends to be uh, the priest. And he says, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. If the women don't get you, the whiskey must. And then they play the song that we're about to play. And this is not a gospel song, and it's not a very respectful song either. But <laughs> it sounds like an old gospel song. But this song, you know, this, is, this song was old when Jelly Roll Morton was playing it. It's called, Oh, Didn't He Ramble.
Jamil Sharif again on the trumpet, yeah, having fun playing today. Now, a little bit more about these brass bands in New Orleans. In the early days of, uh, of jazz, and even before there was jazz, there were great brass bands playing in and around New Orleans. The Excelsior Band was one of the earliest one back, going back to the 1870s. And then the Reliance Band came around, that was in the 1880s, and uh, that was led by Papa Jack Lane. And he was a drummer, but he is most famous for having cultivated this whole, uh, like a whole community of New Orleans musicians. And a lot of them learned to play, you know, while playing for his band. You know, back in those days, sometimes, uh, you know, the band would be hired, you know, they'd hire 10 musicians, and uh, they'd have eight musicians, and they need a couple more. <laughs> and they would just get some kid to come and hold a horn, you know, fill in the space, fill in the space just to make sure they had the number they said they would have. And they also used to have a situation where, uh, you know, some people would spend their entire careers playing what we call peck horn. And uh, peck horn is when all you do is play the rhythms while the other musicians are playing the melodies and harmonies. And so imagine spending your whole musical career going, uh, 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 uh. you know, a lot of saxophone players and horn players. Uh, that's what that's what they used to do. That was their job, you know, but just like in an orchestra everybody has a part And so in a lot of those early bands that was one of the parts that they used to play and in modern bands, too uh, That's something that goes on back then There were also a lot of great bands that they had jazz bands or stage bands Whatever you want to call them and they would also have marching bands, you know They would just change up their instrumentation a little bit for instance instead of a piano They might just have a couple of more horns to play the accompaniment part and instead of, a, instead of a, a bass player, they might have a sousaphone player or a tuba player just so they could m easily move around and parade through the streets. Great musicians like uh, Buddy Bolden had, had a band like that. Buddy Bolden had a, had a marching band. And we also had a, uh, it was a King, uh, King Oliver had a band. Was that the Onward Band? I think he played with the Onward Band, another great uh, famous New Orleans brass band where great musicians were, were, were spawned out of. And so a lot of these bands, they, uh, it, it just became a New Orleans culture. Me personally, when I moved to New Orleans, I was going around looking for work, and uh, one of the things somebody told me, one of the musicians, uh, his name was Bubba, and Bu you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> Bubba told me, boy, go down to Meyer and get yourself a band hat. He's like, it'll cost you $50. It'll cost you $50 at Meyer the Hatter, but get yourself a band hat, then you'll start getting some gigs. Absolutely. And uh, so uh, I got myself a band hat. And so uh, this is a band hat. And uh, you know, it's white on top and black on the bottom. If you get a job playing a funeral and it's a proper band, a lot of times they'll have a black top on the hat. But most of the time they don't expect people to have uh, you know, both black and white hats. So get the whole, you know, if you're a musician coming to New Orleans looking for work, get the white hat first, you know. And uh, this is called a hat band. And a hat band, uh, every band leader has a set of these, and they will, when you arrive at the gig, they give it to you, and you put it on your hat. You know, it helps advertise the name of the band, and you have to remember to give the hat band back at the end of the, <laughs> otherwise you might not get called back. Those will be taken out of your paycheck. Right, they'll, they'll, deduct, they'll deduct it from your paycheck. Anyway, uh, over the years, uh, the brass bands were playing, and a lot of them really struggled during the 1930s. Uh, for instance, uh, the Olympia Band is one of the most famous New Orleans bands of all time, uh, and uh, they, they, they kind of fizzled out during the 1930s. But in the 1945, there was a great New Orleans musician named Bunk Johnson, and Bunk Johnson put a band together specifically to play for uh, uh, Bill Russell, and uh, Bill Russell was doing a... Uh, a record that was like an anthology of great New Orleans brass band tunes. And so uh, 
he, you know, he went and recorded a band, and, uh, and he put a band together just for those recordings, and it really exposed some of the music that was still going on back then. Let's do a little bit of another funeral dirge, but I like talking. This is one that the Olympia band recorded in the 1950s. Uh, and they actually got a spot in a, a movie, and, uh, and this was in the year 1974, if anybody remembers. But this movie came out. It was a James Bond movie. It was called Live and Let Die. And they, they hired, uh, you know, the greatest brass band in New Orleans at the time, and that was the Olympia Band. And they, they had them do a full funeral parade for this movie. And uh, they have a, uh, a casket. They're marching down the street playing a dirge, you know. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the character in the movie goes up to, to, see this, to see this funeral going by. And he turns to the man beside him and says, well, who died? <laughs> and the man next to him says, you. And he stabs him. And the man dies. And they just put him in the coffin. And, per and then they start parading and stuff. It's pretty funny. It's a crazy... Crazy kind of scene, not exactly historically uh, accurate, but a great New Orleans band was captured and immortalized in that scene. And Absolutely. we'll do a little bit of this song just because it would be a shame not to cover this song today. This is called Just a Closer Walk With Thee. We'll just do a little bit of this one. Just a Closer Walk With Thee. And again, thank you all for watching. And again, my name is Richard Piano Scott, and I'm joined today by uh, the great New Orleans legend, Jamil Sharif. And uh, we were talking today about the history of New Orleans brass band music. And uh, uh, once again, we're so excited to be here and part of the New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park. 
And uh, that song was called Just a Closer Walk with Thee. And that's one of those songs that goes back so far in history, we don't know who did it first or who wrote it, but you know, now that song is a New Orleans song. We, we take it. We, uh, that, that's we ours. It. We own it now. That's right. In fact, I'm not from New Orleans. I'm from Virginia. But I remember as I was learning to play piano, my grandfather, who had never been to New Orleans, he would sit and tell me about all oh, the jazz funeral in New Orleans. They play Just a Closer Walk with Thee. And then he would start singing it. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, he'd start singing it. He, and uh, uh, that just really, I was like, man, this, I need to learn this song, you know? So uh, even as a kid, you know, I was, before I even came down here, but help foster my, my excitement, my interest in New Orleans style music. Well, let's do a, you want to try a, let's see. Normally we ask the audience if they have any questions, but nobody has asked anything yet. Not they yet. All right, right. <laughs> but we're excited to be playing for the cameras, too. And if, sir, if you have any questions, let us know, okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, let's do it. Now, let's talk a little bit more about, okay, through the 1950s, they had the, uh, the Olympia Brass Band, and they were playing. But over time, as music began to change and, and you know, rock and roll became popular and that kind of thing, the New Orleans uh, brass band tradition began to struggle a little bit. And uh, we, we, really, uh, we really owe a whole lot to uh, the minister at Fairview Baptist Church because he, uh, he was looking for a program, a way to get the kids involved in something. And he had a great musician in his congregation. And uh, Danny Barker was his name. And Danny Barker was a very experienced jazz musician who grew up in New Orleans and then had gone up to New York and and uh, on the West Coast and had recorded with some of the great legends of jazz and then decided to come back to New Orleans with his wife, Blue Lou Barker. And uh, so, you know, Danny Barker asked the minister of the church, he was like, how is it that we can get involved with the church? And the minister said, I would love for you to start a band with the kids. And so Danny Barker started a, a band called the Fairview Baptist Church you know, Band. And, and it's really fascinating that he had a lot of these... Uh, these uh, musicians in the band who, uh, you know, they were just kids at the time. This is, he started it in the year 1970. And uh, he got these kids together, and most of these kids that were in that band, they grew up to be not just successful, but like New Orleans legends, you know, and people who started other bands. And uh, some of the members of this band went on to, to, to form like traditional style New Orleans bands, uh, like Michael White. Or now, of course, now is Dr. Michael White, who formed the Liberty Brass Band, a very traditional brass band. And then uh, another one, Greg Stafford, a great trumpet player. Uh, he, has, he led the band, the Young Tuxedo Brass Band as well. And then uh, some other members of the band, let's see, uh, Kirk Joseph. Uh, he, he, he and um, I wrote the name of that. He, he started uh, the, the Dirty Dozen Brass Band. And so that band took, took the brass band tradition in a whole different direction. And, uh, you know, they started playing popular music. But in the 1950s, the, uh, the Eureka Band did some of the very first and most prominent recordings. And uh, we're going to do a couple songs that they recorded. I think it's great to, uh, to do these songs because they showed that in addition to doing, you know, spirituals and funeral dirges, Brass bands were playing pop songs back in those days. And uh, we're going to do a couple of the popular songs that those bands did. Then we're going to do one called Old Lady Be Good. And this is recorded by the Eureka Brass Band back in the 1950s.
Lady Be Good. And uh, that, of course, is an old popular song. I think George Gershwin wrote that one. George and Ira Gershwin. And uh, that's one of the songs. I guess it was a big hit in the 1930s and 40s, but it was a popular song, and that was one of the styles of music that brass bands used to play. Here's one that everybody likes to hear, and everybody thinks about New Orleans when they hear this song. It's a fun old song to do, and one that the Eureka Band actually recorded, I think, in the early 1960s. And it's interesting to note because the song was just a few years old then. And so it was practically a, a new song when they played Jambalaya on the Bayou. playing for you today. That song, of course, was uh, Jambalaya on the Bayou. And it's neat to play that song for a number of reasons. Like so many things in New Orleans culture, it's such a mix-up of so many different things. Of course, it's a country song uh, written by a country music legend, Hank Williams. And, uh, but it's also sort of a, a Cajun song. And if you're a Cajun musician, you probably are tired of playing that song. Because every time you pick up your accordion or something, everyone's going to ask you, or your washboard, everyone's going to ask you, hey, can you put a drum line? Yeah, you better. And then, uh, you know, then New Orleans jazz bands play it, and New Orleans brass bands off, oftentimes play that song. So, you know, it's, it's a beautiful song. It's, it's simple enough that can, it can easily be interpreted on lots of different instruments. So, yeah. Uh, but that just shows, and what we're talking about there is how 
you know, brass bands played all sorts of songs, including, you know, popular songs. And throughout our program, we started by playing some historic marches that predated jazz, and then we played uh, uh, the blues song, and uh, then we played some spirituals, we played a couple pop songs, and then there was Oh Didn't He Ramble, which really doesn't fall into any category that I've ever heard of. Well, we're going to play one more song, and uh, I guess this song falls on under the uh, popular song category. This song was uh, originally written for uh, minstrel shows, which were traveling shows normally that included oftentimes a musician dressed up in blackface. Sometimes they were white musicians, but oftentimes they were African-American musicians just doing their show. And a lot of the early New Orleans jazz musicians Part of their work, in many cases, while during their career, was playing in these traveling shows. This song was written to be in one of those shows, but, you know, New Orleans musicians, it's such a great song. New Orleans musicians play it all the time. And uh, you'll hear this song, and, you know, it's forever associated with New Orleans now. We own this song, too. But it's an important song to also play because this song was on the very first album recorded by the Dirty Dozen Brass Band. And it's called Little Liza Jane. And if you feel like singing at home, it's okay, because we're not there to laugh at you. You know, <laughs> we're not going to laugh. Oh, oh, okay, no more singing. Uh, no, we, we don't care, because we're not there. So go ahead and sing along and uh, entertain your coworkers or your kids or your dogs or your pets and get them to join in. We're getting a little bit of a uh, little Liza Jane.
Oh yeah, little Liza Jane. And again, it has been our pleasure playing for you today. And we hope you know a little bit more about the New Orleans brass band tradition. And if you turn on this program to ask, well, you know, I'm thinking of hiring a brass band for my, for my <laughs> wedding or you know, something like that. You know, and if you're wondering, you know, what brass band you should hire, well, the answer is simple. Us, that's right. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we'll come and play for your, your event. Basically, everybody, every musician in New Orleans either has a brass band or plays in a brass band. And so uh, there's, there's plenty of choices. And so, uh, yeah, but, you know, it's great to hire a brass band and to keep that tradition going. Just make sure if you hire a brass band, don't, don't settle for three or four musicians. Aww. You can't do a brass band with three or four musicians. Uh, spend the money. Make it right. Do, a, you know, seven or eight musicians works. Nine or ten musicians you'll, is totally worth it. I would, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, Jamil, yeah, we both agree on that. Uh, and, uh, okay, we got to do a quick thank you to the people who helped make this presentation possible. The New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park, including Ranger John Beebe helping make our program happen today, and uh, Ranger Matt Hampsey. And we got Rick back here helping with the sound, making sure everything sounds good and um, making everything great. So it's been our pleasure playing for you. Please stay tuned. Um, we keep, we're we're going to keep making these videos until we can have y'all back in here. And so keep watching the videos. And then as soon as you can get down to New Orleans, come down and see us and hang out and check out the programs that we offer almost every day down here in New Orleans. Thanks again. Travel safe, y'all. See you later. I want to be... Oh.